Welcome back guys, in this video we are going to revisit a computer that hasn't been used for about 25 years. It's a 486DX4 100MHz. This is the Rust Bucket. I bought this thing complete as it sits from a friend that does sales all over the country and finds a lot of vintage hardware. He told me it was a 486 but it had been sitting for a while here and despite the Pentium sticker it is in fact a 486. This computer doesn't have the modern standard connectors we are accustomed to so to use it I managed to get a Soda's new keyboard with the old AT connector and a serial mouse I had to get used and this one is as ugly as the rest of the rust bucket. Trying to use it as it is I wasn't very lucky it wasn't detecting any hard drives Inside, it's just a mess of ribbon cables and to no one's surprise, the hard drives were disconnected. Right now, we can't tell how long it's gonna take to get this thing working again, so the best strategy is minimalism. I'll remove all that isn't necessary, give it a good cleanup, and we can go from there. Here we can see our beautiful 486DX4 100MHz processor. The DX4 was released in 1994 and it was the fastest 486 Intel launched with a 33 MHz bus and a 3x multiplier to get to the 100 MHz CPU clock. The Rust Bucket features a Trident 9440 video card with a total of 1 MB of video memory expandable to 2 MB. It's a Windows 2D accelerator card but Trident was usually not the place to go for high performance. Nevertheless, the card should work fine for some light DOS gaming that doesn't require 3D acceleration. The sound card is the best part of the Rust Bucket. It's a Sound Blaster AWE64 released in 1996 and it's compatible with applications that support the AWE32, Sound Blaster 16 and Sound Blaster Pro, allowing you to test any of those sound profiles in games. I gave the expansion cards a good cleanup as well as the rust buckets case which is a bit of a lost cause at this point. So everything is back together in the rusty case and I slapped a working floppy disk drive as well as a CD-ROM drive. I don't have a beige one but the rust buckets yellow tint would never be attainable either way. It's a shame the 24 speed creative CD-ROM drive is not working but it will wait for restoration somewhere in the backlog. I also have this SD to IDE adapter I might as well use. This way, once everything is installed, I can remove the SD, copy programs and games to it using a modern system and put it back in the 486, making it quite easy to transfer files to and from. First step seems to have worked, the BIOS detects the SD automatically as a normal drive. First thing I want to do now is get a working system so I want to install pure DOS because there are plenty of DOS applications and games to play around with. The Rust Bucket doesn't have USB ports, and it doesn't detect the CD-ROM drive in the BIOS and boot through it like modernish computers would. So one thing I'm absolutely sure I'll need is a 3.5 inch disk drive to copy files to disks. Fortunately the 1366 socket motherboard of the lab PC still has a floppy disk drive port. Phil from Phil's Computer Lab has made something called a DOS starter pack available for download in his website, so we are going to get that. We're also going to need a boot drive with DOS. You can get that at bootdisk.com. So I downloaded those files and created two disks, one with Phil's DOS starter pack and a bootable DOS 6.22 disk. At this point we finally have everything we need to start using the Rust bucket. So now we go back to the BIOS, find where to change the boot order to start with the floppy drive, the letter A drive, make sure we have the boot disk in there and restart the system. And after 25 years of abandonment, we get the first DOS prompt on the Rust bucket. What we need to do now is make the system boot without the need of a floppy disk in the drive. For that, we need to format our main hard drive, in this case being played by our SD memory card. So we use FDisk from the DOS 6.22 boot disk to first delete the current file system on the SD and then create a DOS partition. Now we format it with the slash s option so the system files are copied and we can boot from the SD. So to have the tools provided in DOS 6.22 in hand, we are going to create a directory called DOS and copy everything the boot disk to it. Ok, so what else? Well now, we are going to use that nifty starter pack provided by Phil. The starter pack installs a start menu with different options for memory configuration and sets up the driver for the CD-ROM drive and the mouse. 
So now every time we start the rust bucket, we get this little menu where we can choose different configurations depending on what the game we want to play requires. The last thing we need to get ready for our games is the sound card driver. Again, we resort to Phil's website to download the proper driver, but this time I copied it directly to the SD card from a modern computer and ran it in the Rust bucket. The driver installation program does all the settings necessary, so when the Rust bucket boots, it already loads the driver, just like the mouse and the CD-ROM drive. Since we're using the Sound Blaster AWE64, a plug and play card, Besides the basic Sound Blaster driver, ironically, we need to install an extra piece of software from Creative called CTCM. Alright, this was a long one guys, I'm sorry for that, but I enjoy portraying at least a bit of reality in these videos, although it was very edited to seem like things took less time than what they actually took. To test the Rust bucket, we busted out four games, Duke Nukem 3D from 3D Realms, Star Wars Dark Forces from LucasArts, Road and Track presents The Need for Speed from the almighty Electronic Arts Studio, and last, Siberia from Interplay. All of them but the Need for Speed recommend a 486DX266. Need for Speed recommends a Pentium but does support a 486 in the minimum requirements. That means we should be in good shape with our 486DX4 100MHz. Duke Nukem 3D was released in 1996 following the great success of Wolfenstein 3D and Doom. The build engine in which it was developed had over 10 games done with it including a game from 2019 with some modern updates called Iron Fury. Duke Nukem 3D is an iconic game in which you play Duke, a mercenary sent to defend Earth from some human-pig alien hybrids. The game is known for some awesome catchphrases thrown by Duke like the sorts of Damn. Those alien bastards are gonna pay for shooting up my ride. Star Wars The Dark Forces was released in 1995 and it uses a game engine developed specifically for it called the Jedi Game Engine. I cannot believe how good this game looks in a 486. Textures are really clean and there isn't even any texture filtering or 3D acceleration. It's just like Wolfenstein 3D but looks a lot better. I'm not putting Wolf 3D down here. There is a merit to being a pioneer, but this game looks absolutely stunning for what it is in the system that's running it. Road and Track presents the Need for Speed. The origin of all NFS games we have grown to play and love was released in August of 1994. In this game, EA cooperated with the magazine Road and Track to match the sounds, handling and performance of the games to real life. Come to think of it, the game does kind of feel like a magazine with pages of history and product sheets of the cars, as well as the FMV intro looks just like a 90s ad for a car magazine. The last game we are taking a look in this video with the Rust Bucket is Siberia. Released in 1994, this game mixes adventure game mechanics with a shooting arcade game. I didn't get into it too much, it's very interesting, but it didn't age well at all. The game was lauded for taking full advantage of the CD-ROM media using cinematic cutscenes and voice acting, but you can probably see by the video that it's a bit clunky by today's standards. Watch it. So that was it. That was the debut of the Rust Bucket. What did you think? In the beginning, I was a bit overwhelmed. It's been a long time since I've used a DOS computer, even though the DOS manual was my bedside book back in the 90s. Thankfully, Phil from Phil's Computer Lab has done a ton of guides and it makes it a lot easier to get retro machines like the 486 back up and running. Don't forget to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you next time.